So we're live here. Uh, welcome everybody. We're the uh, we're the we're this is the, the 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 first edition of the Brazilian Representative Initiative debate, debate series. Uh, we're pleased to host uh, Dr. Gilbert Feldman from uh, Hong Kong University, who will be talking about representability with us. So I'll just pull up my my presentation here. Uh, let's see where this is. There you go. So uh, I'll just share my screen now. Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, so this was actually uh, this was actually meant to be a live event a while ago. Uh, so Gilbert was actually in Brazil uh, a around a month ago, and this was actually a big excuse to have a barbecue. So we're really happy that we're like about to start experiments. Uh, in the Brazilian representative, we, we wanted to get our teams together. So we're holding this crazy idea of having like this multi-center barbecue, like one in Sao Paulo, one in Rio, one in Porto Alegre. Uh, and we had to like give it lecture to, uh, as an excuse, uh, exactly a month ago, 20, March 24th. And uh, of course, uh, something went wrong uh, in the process. Uh, we were, uh, uh, the university closed like three days after we announced this. So, and it's probably not as much fun to have a barbecue uh, on, in a screen, it's kind of like this uh, dog television kind of thing. So we we'll have no barbecue today. It's early in the morning anyway. But uh, given the possibilities, we're very welcome to host Give It uh, online. Uh, he's not in Brazil anymore. I guess you're still in Israel at the moment. So yeah, he escaped uh, just in time. But we're uh, we're pleased to have him here. So uh, the, the it's nice to host as open science people because they're very easy to present because they have like web pages where the presentation is ready. I just kind of like copy and paste it from from his own website. But Gilbert is a, is a is, is, is a psychologist. He's been in uh, HKU since uh, 2017, and he mostly focuses on judgment and decision making. But he's actually very much into like uh, doing large scale replications and using uh, uh, whatever. Uh, whatever kind of, of, of labor he can find, students, collaborators, co colleagues, etc., to try to make this happen, which is kind of like what we do as well. It's like we're basically a, 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 a group of people trying to engage people into mass replication. And I guess this is pretty much uh, one of Gilbert's main interests. Uh, he's a very dedicated open science supporter, so we're very pleased to have him here. So we have him talk for 20 minutes, maybe open up for questions. I'll talk for about 20 minutes, open up for questions, and then we just uh, debate among everybody, uh, we should end around maybe 11.30 or something like that. So give it thanks for coming here, whatever here is, and uh, you're welcome to, to speak. Thank you. Uh, uh, it's great to be here. I'm happy that we had the opportunity to do this, uh, although it didn't work out in, in Brazil. Uh, let me just share my screen with you. So this is my uh, presentation. Um, so as you can see, uh, all the slides are downloadable, so you can just uh, take whatever it is uh, that's here and um, look at this offline uh, and follow while I'm talking. There's lots of hidden slides, so uh, the original presentation uh, takes about an hour, and this is what I was doing in different parts of uh, Sao Paulo, hoping to do this also in, in Rio, but that didn't work out. Um, and I do this because I want to share uh, with people uh, what it is that we do in this uh, uh, open science mass replication effort at University of Hong Kong with many uh, different collaborators around the world. Um, share this a little bit with you. It's going to be a bit of a rush in 20 minutes. Uh, some things I assume that you already uh, know, open science, uh, know that, but I will be going over this uh, briefly. If you want uh, the full presentation, uh, the Sao Paulo University folks uh, videoed, uh, recorded everything. So you can go on this link on YouTube and watch the, uh, and, and watch the entire uh, one, one and a half hour uh, presentation that goes into things in more depth, uh, covering some uh, personal stories and uh, things about what happened in my career to, uh, that led me to, to do this uh, sort of thing. Generally, the message that I have uh, when I talk to people about open science is that we are in a process of figuring out what is going on with our science. And there are some signs uh, that things are not as good as we have hoped uh, with science. Uh, some have uh, called this a crisis, a replication, reproducibility crisis. 
And my personal takeaway from this, uh, which is what I'm trying to talk to people about, is that we uh, need to do a credibility revolution uh, and we need to do this fast. We can't uh, take our time with this. And I think the coronavirus and the current crisis around the world uh, has, has led us to uh, this conclusion a lot faster uh, than before. So we need open science in order to get to the right conclusions uh, uh, and solutions to address uh, this crisis. So uh, we must improve the way that we do research. There are all sorts of things that we've been doing uh, wrong uh, in our universities and academia. We also have to change the way that we teach. And I'm going to talk about how we did this at the University of Hong Kong. We really have to start working together. Uh, if any uh, small lab will try to address the coronavirus by itself, we will not solve this. Uh, but if we mass mobilize everybody together, uh, collaborating uh, efforts uh, in different labs around the world, there is a chance that we'll be able to solve this in time uh, without uh, mass casualties uh, beyond uh, what, what is happening right now. Um, and my take on this, and I think this is something that has not happened uh, yet, um, is to mass mobilize students, how to work with students, undergraduates, as early as second year uh, to, to address uh, this crisis. There's a timeline that I usually show about what happened, when did this start? So uh, I date this back in my career to 2011, although there are signs in 2005 with seminal paper about how uh, most published findings are false. Uh, but for me, it started in 2011. There's all sorts of uh, different efforts that came out and different uh, uh, things in this timeline that were big events. But it took us uh, about 2011 to 2015 to kind of uh, mass mobilize uh, researchers to try and uh, start running replication. So in order to validate, uh, uh, to assess what is going on with our science, we wanted to try and do as many replications as we could. So you can see over here, there's many labs number one, many labs number three. It took three more years in 2013 to do many labs two um, uh, to get it published. Uh, but finally, 2015, 2016, uh, there was uh, the first signs, like massive, big signs that some things are wrong. A lot of big findings that we communicated to the public, like the power posing over here and, uh, and ego depletion and uh, social priming failed to replicate in, in uh, psychology. And I took this as, as, as a sign that something is very wrong. And some of these stories, like the self-control as a limited resource, is something that I find uh, uh, specifically uh, for me important because I was involved in a lab uh, uh, that led this, uh, this effort, this theory. Uh, but I think that the main change came in 2015 with the science paper uh, where they found um, uh, for us very disappointing findings that only 36% uh, percent of all uh, attempted replications uh, actually succeeded. And uh, in those, the effect size was about half of what uh, the original was. So if the published findings were about an average of a correlation of 0.4, uh, then in the replication, it was 0.2. Uh, um, and then uh, since 2015, we've had a, a lot of RRR, uh, uh, registered uh, replication reports, um, where a lot of different labs from around the world come together in order to try and assess um, what, what is going on with our science. Uh, this is the one that I mentioned before about ego depletion, self-control as a limited resource um, that I, I feel connected to uh, specifically, found no effect uh, whatsoever, and this is the tweet that summarizes everything with an effect size of uh, Cohen's D of 0.08, uh, uh, which is tiny. Uh, so if you do a, a power analysis, you would need something around uh, 5,000 participants to test this. Uh, but since then, we've had all sorts of uh, mass certification efforts. So this is uh, thir 13 out of 21 um, psychology papers in nature, in science, um, only 13 of 21 replicated and the effect size was much uh, weaker than the ones published. And uh, this one here, uh, the many labs uh, too that finally got published in 2018, we're talking about 14 out of the 28. Uh, a very impressive project with a lot of uh, labs collaborating, uh, many different uh, samples, 7,000 participants, uh, disappointing uh, findings. If we summarize all this together, to put this in, in perspective, it's 
comes together with these mass replication efforts, the, uh, the replication rate in uh, social psychology is about uh, 47%. Uh, we've also been doing a lot of uh, registered replication reports uh, for many other things and a lot of failures to replicate, especially things in terms of social priming, things about embodiment, but uh, the good news is that some things are replicable. Um, uh, this is some signs uh, that this is happening. Uh, for some things, uh, JDM, judgment decision making, which is something that I'm personally focused on in the last two, three years, uh, seems to be doing fairly uh, better than, than most. So many people at the beginning said, perhaps this is a problem with psychology. Uh, if we, uh, we didn't expect much in psychology, so of course, if we'll test uh, psychology, replicability, reproducibility problem, uh, then, then we'll find these disappointing findings. But since 2015, we've started doing this in, in other places. Uh, medicine has been doing this for a while and then stopped and now uh, started again. And then these, these big headlines started to come out and saying that this is not just limited to psychology. This is happening in many other disciplines uh, like uh, chemical research, uh, economics, cancer research, and so forth. I try to summarize all these findings. You can go uh, on these slides and have a look. Uh, I just wanna say that this is not a problem in psychology. Also the hard sciences, the exact sciences have some issues. These are preliminary findings. These are initial replication evidence uh, because we haven't been doing replications enough. Definitely not in the hard sciences where uh, things are proprietary, there's uh, patents, uh, there's all sorts of uh, incentives not to share information. So if we look at the hard sciences, actually psychology uh, seems to be doing better than many of those. So the rates are very, very disappointing, very low. And I think the biggest one here is cancer biology, uh, where in 32 out of the 50, they weren't even able to reproduce the material, the process, what is needed to uh, be done about this. Uh, so only 18 out of 50 could start. And out of those, 14 has uh, finished so far, only uh, nine out of those. Uh, was replicated. So uh, seems like uh, there's some issue here. So at some point, Nature decided to do uh, a survey and and uh, and ask people, do you think there's, there's a crisis? And about 90% said that there's either a significant crisis, 50%, uh, or 38, a spike crisis. Uh, so there seems to be some consensus that something is wrong, uh, and we need to look at this more carefully. Uh, and the way to look at this is to do a lot of replications and see what works and what doesn't. And, and while we're doing replications, figure out what it is uh, that isn't working very well in science. So for a while now, I've been going around and talking about this, uh, um, this process, this open science issue, the credibility revolution, but there hasn't been any good resource uh, for that. So when my students ask me, so where can we learn about this? Uh, we want to read about this. I gave them some blog posts. I gave them some podcasts. I gave them some videos online. But there wasn't really a book uh, to summarize this whole thing. So in the last semester, I used Open Science Collaborative uh, Google Docs, where I invited my students to help me write this. So we uh, separated the chapters, and a group of six uh, students uh, got each chapter. And then the TAs gave some feedback and people came from online. And finally, there's a book of about 200 pages about what is the open science uh, credibility revolution process? Uh, what is the replication crisis? Uh, so if you want to know more about this, you're welcome to go uh, in here and have a look and read a little bit more about that. And uh, you're invited to also collaborate on this. So everything that we do, everything that I'm showing you here, is something that you can go in and contribute. So if you go in and edit, add your name, and when we submit this somewhere, uh, you will be a co-author. So everything is collaborative. My summary about this uh, uh, very short interview of the crisis is that I'm convinced that there's a crisis. So there's something that we need to look at very carefully over here. But I get a lot of pushback on this, uh, especially as I communicate with people whose uh, work we try and replicate. Uh, a lot of uh, senior uh, top scholars in the field have some issues uh, with the open science movement or uh, the need for replications or why this should be published. So the way that I summarize this whole thing is that I'm convinced that there's a crisis, it's okay that uh, if you're not, but at the very least know what is happening. Uh, follow the articles that are coming out in the mass replication efforts uh, and evaluate the findings to see if this is in line with your expectations. 
When I started my journey, I'm only a third year assistant uh, professor at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, I was a postdoc and I started this uh, open science journey uh, when I was a postdoc in the Netherlands. They seem to be very dedicated to the open science movement following some disappointments, especially a big fraud case, uh, Diedrich Sapo. Uh, so they took it upon themselves. They took responsibility in leading uh, an open science uh, movement. Uh, so I learned a lot of things while in the Netherlands and I set some principles for myself, which is what I aim to do um, in my own research. So this is where I think we're headed. We need to uh, emphasize trustworthiness, uh, reproducibility and replicability. And the way that we do this is following all these uh, uh, principles. So we need to uh, look at effect sizes rather than on this p-value, no hypothesis significance testing uh, a criteria of 0.05. Uh, we do a lot more replications, doing registered reports and pre-registrations. I think that the most important one here is that we need full transparency, uh, not only sharing uh, all the data sets, but we also need the code in order to figure out what's going on. And it needs to be very well documented and it needs to uh, uh, be one that anybody can run and follow what it is that we did. But also every decision that we've made from the first time that we ever thought about uh, an issue up until uh, when we publish it, everything needs to be documented about all the decisions because there's so much flexibility when we do research about how to analyze, how to think, how to design uh, uh, the experiments or the studies. Uh, so uh, I document everything, I share everything. If you go on my website, you'll see uh, each project, what status it's in, and you can go and, and, and check the open science framework in order to see what's going on with this. Uh, this is a slide that I really like from Simin Vazir uh, about the difference uh, between incredible, you know, this, uh, we have these amazing findings that we publish in Nature and Science, uh, moving from this incredible where papers are advertisements and, and only few people get all the glory and people do uh, things in, in their own lab and there's blind faith in this peer review, this magical peer review process, moving to uh, credibility here on the left. So being more transparent, doing pre-registrations, uh, being very open about our conflicts of interest and, and giving uh, credit to contributions, allowing people to replicate our work, um, just trying to minimize errors uh, in published uh, research. So this is kind of an, uh, like the, 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 what led me to, to uh, my, my beginning of my position at University of Hong Kong. Uh, the main insights for me was that uh, we need to change the way that we do research. But if we do this on our own, if it's just us professors, it's gonna take us a very long time. So we need to start working with our, our students. Uh, so we have these big classes. I teach classes of uh, up to 100, sometimes 150. Uh, we have even bigger classes uh, than that. So uh, as early as second year, we can work with our students. We can train them, even if we, they come into our classroom not knowing a lot of statistics and not knowing anything about open science, uh, I have taken um, uh, the opportunity given to me by University of Hong Kong to try and in one semester get them from almost knowing nothing about science to completing a whole project of doing a replication of a classic finding in judgment and decision making. Um, so I took some ideas from other projects that are happening. Uh, there's this CREP and the Psychological Science Accelerator. You can follow these links and and read a little bit more about that. Also, Sanjay here has this uh, really interesting syllabus about how everything needs to be fixed, psychology, significance testing. So I go with my students every week. We talk about uh, different things that need to be uh, changed. What is the current uh, situation in science and what needs to be uh, improved? But the main principles are that students lead the way. Right now, most of our books contain a lot of findings that we cannot replicate, um, and we can work with them in order to try and figure out what is actually uh, uh, replicable, trustworthy, and what isn't. I'm going to very briefly go over the process of how we do replications. So uh, each um, replication target, each article that we want to uh, replicate is given to two teams of two students working independently. And these teams are working on the same target, but then at some point, so they design the Qualtrics survey. So this is kind of like an online experiment that it can, can be run. We, rend, uh, we randomly generate a data set from Qualtrics and then they in advance uh, do a data analysis plan. They write a pre-registration report 
And then they peer review one another. So the two teams switch and then they look at what the other team has done. They also get uh, external feedback, both from the uh, TAs, uh, myself and other people, other scholars. So I open everything up on Twitter. Then we do, uh, then they do a revision. They give this to me. I do all the pre-registrations of the Open Science Framework. I do all the data collections online using Amazon Mechanical Turk and Prolific. And then once again, they do data analysis. They peer review one another. They write the final report. They get uh, uh, external peer reviews, open peer review on Twitter. And then finally, they submit a revised uh, final uh, report, um, uh, which is supposed to be a manuscript that can be taken almost as is and submitted to a journal. Uh, we don't submit this just yet, but some of them are very, very high quality. There's one more step uh, missing, and this is the step where I invite you to join us on this journey. But I just want to say that these reports here at the end of the semester are already quality that includes everything from, you know, is uh, introduction, uh, methods, results, discussion, uh, full transparency, everything included. And we share this with the world. We put this on the open science framework. If you want to know how I do this, it's very uh, uh, simple, uh, but we don't have, have enough time to go into this. Everything that I do in the spirit of open science is available to you on the open science framework. So you can go here, click on these links and see what it is that we do in our uh, process. In our replication effort, uh, is slightly higher than in social psychology, so judgment decision making, our replicability rate is about uh, 70%, uh, and we ran 57 of those. So if you think about this, in three semesters, using uh, our work with my uh, students at University of Hong Kong, we were able to achieve 57 replications, making this one of the, the largest uh, uh, social psychology uh, replication efforts. Uh, so there's a lot of things that you can do with this, and if you expected uh, very little of students and uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk online data collection, then I think 70% speaks not only to the replicability of judgment decision making, but also uh, what it is that you can do with students. We're doing a lot of other things. Uh, this is an open invitation to you. So uh, we develop resources to help other people, not just ourselves, uh, conduct replication. So if you want to conduct a replication, we have a very detailed guide over here. We have a collaborative guide on uh, how to do extensions. We have a collaborative guide on how to do R, Jamovi, JAS, uh, how to calculate effect sizes, uh, how to work with the Qualtrics. And all of these are open to you to come and uh, co-author with us. So if you contribute anything, just put in your name. And when we submit this to the journal, uh, you'll be a co-author. We also have some really great uh, templates that you can take in and use. Uh, and this really helps students uh, go with structure, with instructions, step by step on what it is that a report needs to be uh, done. I won't go into this, but if you want to see how, how good these reports are, you're welcome to evaluate these. Everything is open, everything is shared, just follow uh, the links. They did a really good job with this. And this is the open uh, invitation to you, almost the last slide. Uh, if you want to join us, what it is that we do is that we invite other scholars, typically early career researchers, uh, end of PhD, postdoc, or beginning of assistant professor, to come and take our students' reports, verify these, add some analysis, make sure that the introduction and the discussion uh, are solid, and then submit this to the journal with you as the lead author. Uh, we right now have about 15 collaborators. Uh, as you know, we have 57 projects completed, so there's 30 more that are waiting for you to come in and take the lead. Uh, and some of those are already published. So we are able to publish these replications in really good uh, journals. So this is from SPPS that's, uh, and JSP. Uh, these are uh, good journals in our, in our field. In metapsychology, this is a, a, new, a new journal, completely open peer review. As you can see, these under, uh, underlined uh, people are my students, and these are the uh, early career researchers that took the, took the lead. We also have a lot of preprints, so you can follow all that. Uh, we've been getting some media attention, uh, giving us uh, some compliments about how um, this, this is a good evidence that rigorous replications can be run by researchers who do not yet have a PhD. So we don't, we don't need scholars or only scholars to do these replications. We can work with our students uh, on that. Uh, not only replications, we do other things like assessments. So if you want to look at what other people have done in their research, so we have a template for that, and that's a whole different other project that we can talk about later. But we can mass mobilize students not only to do replications, but also to evaluate 
what it is that's out there, evaluate people's pre-registration, their code, their data, and what it is that they shared. So you can join us in all sorts of different ways, collaborate with us on manuals, integrate this into your courses. Uh, bottom line is, tell me how I can help you to do open science and promote uh, replications, reproducibility uh, in your field. Everything that I just talked about is summarized in this page. So you can go on this, click on there, on the link over here, and it will give you a long list of all the resources, everything that's open, a lot of explanations, and all my contact details are up over here. So if you want to have a more uh, personal discussion about this, you're welcome to contact me at any time. Thank you. I think you need to unmute the microphone. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. This, this was really great. Uh, if anybody has a very pressing question uh, concerning specific topics uh, within Give it uh, lecture, you can do it now. Uh, otherwise, if there's very general questions which might be interesting for me to pitch in as well, uh, you can also open, I mean, wait for my 20 minute uh, lecture here and, and, and we can do a, a big Q&A afterwards. But if anybody has a, has a more specific question, I think we can open, we can open right now. You can do you, you can either raise your hand or or, or or do it via chat. If not, I think I'll just move on. You can also do I mean you, you can ask ask questions while we speak uh, via the, the, the chat button below. So I mean we're, I mean we just might not answer it them immediately, but they will they, they, they will be stuck there once we are uh, once we're done here. Uh Clarissa Nascimento uh the as from your experience how open other areas in biology are for open science projects that might be better for us to talk later because i, th I think that's one big question like psychology is doing much better than we are and but uh, I, I you can you can say yeah so i don't know a lot about this aside from the little that i see in like uh meta science uh, conferences and what i follow online on twitter so there seems to be uh, some projects right now, including this uh, cancer um, uh, reproducibility uh, project. And it seems like things are not uh, going very smoothly. There's lots of uh, issues, especially with uh, reproducibility, with just understanding what it is that these scholars did in, in their lab, because I think uh, by nature, by default, we're not open about the way that we do biology uh, uh, research. So. There's a lot of, this actually surprised me because I, I also thought that the psychology was behind on this, uh, but I understand now all the challenges about being open about all this, especially in a very competitive market where you need to capitalize uh, your, your ideas at the end. Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, I, I'm excited about working with people in biology because we don't do this a lot. Um, just try and see how we can uh, like leverage what it is that we're doing in psychology, leverage what, what happening in biology in order to create something that's uh, shared, moving from just psychology to more meta science. Yeah, of course, we can't, we can't do it over Mechanical Turk, right? So, I mean, we, we have some, some big disadvantages. It's more expensive. Yeah. So, I, I, I'll go into that. Maybe I'll, I'll just use this yeah, as, the, as, the, as the hook to my lecture. So, let me share my screen here. Uh, let me just find, yeah, so here I am. Uh, so moving on, uh, we're trying to, to then switch gears from psychology to biology, but uh, acknowledging that psychology is ahead on this. Of course, they have some advantages. A lot of it is like cheaper to do. You can do it online, but they have also moved uh, ahead of us. I mean, they've been discussing this very, very intensively uh, over a decade at least now. And I think we're, we're getting there, but we, we, we're getting there late. So uh, I'll, I'll skip the the part of, of why reproducibility is important and that we have a problem. I think it has talked about that. Uh, I'll just, uh, uh, so, 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 so uh, you, you can take his word for, for this, but I, I'll, I'll just point out the fact that we have very, very little data on this in biology. We have this uh, papers from pharma from around uh, almost 10 years ago now, uh, which say, well, we can reproduce 11% or 21% 20, of, of, of what's published in academic papers, but those are like very out of the blue numbers, these are industry numbers. We don't have, this is very bad in, in terms of open science. We don't know the papers, etc. That said, they made an impact. I think they, they got people talking. The closest we have to a more like fully open science project is a reproducibility project, cancer biology, by uh, Tim Arrington uh, at the Center of open, of open Science, which has run into a lot of trouble. I mean, they have replicated 15 studies, and this is probably like the best data set we have 
And there's like 15 studies, highly selected, very highly cited uh, within a specific field. So, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't really have a lot of data on how much of the biology literature actually reproduces. And it's hard to get. Like the, uh, the RPCB cost uh, around a million dollars. Like e e each paper replicated here is probably as expensive as the whole of the 57 replications that Gilead uh, showed us uh, seriously. So it's, it's, it's a challenge, right? And maybe it's money we should be setting up to, to, to spend, but uh, it's not particularly in the culture of, of funding agencies or institutions. I mean, uh, if you do, and we, we, we don't have numbers uh, in, in, in an international setting and much less at a local setting. And again, I think it's important to evaluate purposefully at a local setting. Uh, we, we, we know that it's probably very connected to like how science is incentivized, how the scientific environment uh, functions. And of course, that is very local. I mean, the, the kind of thing you, 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 you incentivize people to do have to do with like national funding agencies, local state funding agencies. And what we have seen in Brazil over the last uh, 20 years, uh, maybe more, it's like a explosive growth. Of course, now we're tapering. This goes up to 2015. Now we're, we're going through a bad slump. This is probably falling a bit. But again, like from the 90s to, to 2015, uh, at least, we had a, 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 a very large growth and people have been optimistic about it. Uh, we, I mean, a lot of, uh, in terms of like published papers, uh, uh, grad students, uh, a, 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 everything grew very fast. Uh, and even when people uh, manifest worry about it, it's mostly about, okay, oh, so yeah, we're, we're growing, we're publishing more, but we're, I mean, we're, we're not getting cited much more. The impact is about the same. So we're doing more of the same. It's salami science, whatever, uh, which is important. But I mean, there's a much more pressing question here is that whether this is actually true. I mean, if you're just like growing out, uh, growing our scientific output in terms of like junk data and, and things that do not reproduce, this is actually not, not good news at all. I mean, it could be a, like a cancer uh, in terms of like, unregulated growth, which ends up uh, in, into bad science. That said, again, that is not exactly, it's, it's not a very popular thing to evaluate your own science. I mean, um, funding agencies are not really typically very willing to do it, institutions are not. Uh, but I guess, again, if, you, if this is out of the scope of funding agencies, not only in Brazil, but elsewhere in the world, I think it should become the duty of the scientific community. And I think it's telling that most big replication projects have been grassroots efforts, uh, and most have actually been carried out with uh, private funding. That's the case with the COS projects uh, you had talked about. And we also managed to get funding from this from a private fund in Brazil, which is the Serra Pileira, Inst Serra Pileira Institute, is a very young funder. We're one of their first big projects, and we're very happy to, to have this opportunity to provide some kind of a bird's eye view of uh, particular fields within Brazilian biomedical science. So the Brazilian Reproducibility Initiative is a multi-center effort to estimate the reproducibility of Brazilian biomedical science in some given field. So our aim is to reproduce between 60 and 100 experiments from Brazilian articles over the last 20 years using three to five common lab methods in multiple labs. So this is more or less uh, how our flowchart go goes. I'll, I'll, I'll briefly go into this uh, many steps here. So we started out with a very simple systematic review just to see like what methods and what models are more commonly used in Brazilian science. So as to know in, in what areas can we actually expect to find enough people to do mass replication. So most people use rodent cell lines. There's some common methods. So we, we, we selected 10 common lab methods for further evaluation, which we found in a lot of Brazilian papers. So question blotting, PCR, immunosecondary, like common stuff. And we set out a, a, an open call a couple of years ago uh, to for any labs working within these methods who wanted to reproduce experiments in Brazilian science uh, to join. Uh, of course, uh, we would, uh, through our funders, fund the experiments uh, and people would uh, come in with their time. And uh, we did very intensive outreach for labs, uh, both going to like scientific events in Brazil, going to local universities, doing a lot of social media outreach. We had this, this call open for around three months, I think August through November of, of 2018. And we're actually very successful in recruiting labs, like surprisingly successful. We were expecting maybe to get like 30 to 50 labs interested, we got like 71 labs to sign up, which I mean, was very surprising to us all over the country, really. I mean, most of the Brazilian states had a lab that had at least signed up for the initiative. We couldn't take them all because we had to select some methods, but we're currently around 65 labs strong, which is a lot. Uh, most of course are in the Southeast, but I mean, that's the distribution of Brazilian science. Most people are young. Most got their PhDs after a 2000, well, that's not that young. I mean, that puts me into the young category, but I mean, uh, 
we, we have a bunch of young people who are interested in reproducibility. I think this is awesome and this is the best news of the project so far. Uh, so this is what we currently look like. We do this. Uh, we just had an, an, an online meeting with like around like 50 or 60 uh, participants uh, at the same time. Uh, we never got everybody together uh, in, in the same place because that, that costs money, but we do this online meetings every three months or, or something like that. Uh, and we currently have 65 participating labs. We have the first wave of experiments starting now. Uh, so we have we, we selected three methods for this initial wave. We're not, we would like to add one or two more. We're not sure we have the money for that. So like this is what's guaranteed to happen at the moment. So we have 20 experiments with each method with the MTTSA, which measures self ability in culture, uh, RT-PCR, which measures mRNA expression either in tissue or in culture, and the elevated plus maze, which is a rodent model of anxiety. Uh, so we're taking uh, uh, experiments using cell lines, rats, or mice as biological models. And uh, uh, we selected experience out of a random sample of 30,000 articles in, in Life Sciences Journal with at least half of authors, including the corresponding one based in Brazil. Uh, we did this like via Sci-Hub. We downloaded a lot of PDFs. And then we selected through full text mining and minor screening 20 individual experiments using each method which fit this criteria here. So they had to be a quantitative comparison between two groups. And importantly, we're just taking one experiment out of every paper. So we're not trying to replicate the whole paper as the reproducible project cancer biology, for example. We're taking individual experiments. We do consider experiments as a building block of science. Experiments are quantitative. They have a specific effect. So it's much easier to do statistics over experiments than over papers which have qualitative uh, uh, subjective conclusions. So we're taking experiments which compare to groups which have a statistically significant difference. This is important for us to calculate uh, sample size uh, using the method of interest, uh, which are important enough to be mentioned in the abstract of the paper. So we don't want to get like this negative control or something like that. Uh, and done with commercially available materials because we have to buy stuff to, to do this again, right? Uh, and each experiment will be replicated in three different labs from our network in a blind fashion with bias and for measures, we're calculating sample size to provide 95% power for each individual replication to detect the original difference. We give a very large power for the three of them uh, together. Uh, of course, we know the, the effect sizes are inflated probably in the publication that's given to us about to write it, so we're trying to overshoot uh, so as to have uh, enough power. Uh, importantly, there's another inclusion criteria here, which is we can only replicate experiments in which we have our 20 something labs in each method uh, have enough expertise for us to find three labs that can do it. So of course, like this is filtered through a feasibility thing. We, we cannot, we usually do not take very specialized, very uh, experiments because we won't have three labs being able to do them. So I mean, it's not a real random sample of Brazilian science, but it's like a random sample enriched in uh, simple, cheap and uh, uh, feasible experiments that a lot of people can do. And we're aiming for what we call naturalistic reproducibility. So we're trying to have each lab independently make their own replication decisions in terms, especially of what's not described in the original protocol. So you do get this example. So animals are housed in bulbs, sea mice were housed in pattern free conditions and fed a diet of autoclave food and water. So this is what is in the paper, very little. So we don't really know the age of the animals, the sex of the animals, the weight of the animals, the temperature in the, in the animal facility, whatever. But the idea is if, if this is not mentioned in the paper, each lab should try to do this independently. We want to have the best feeling of what the replication looks like. Looks like if each lab is trying to reproduce this just from using the data from the original paper. So they have to make these decisions. They receive like big forms with big gaps and each lab had to fill this independently in order to get a sense. We don't want to over standardize. If we just like took the same, took a consensus decision of, oh, this is what we do. We're probably underestimating the real interlab variation of people trying to do this, which is important to get to this in data analysis. We had a round of internal peer review as, as, as Gilbert uh, had in his project as well. So these initial protocols went through a round of peer review by an independent lab working the same method and the coordinating team, which aimed to review interpretations from what the paper said and what people actually chose to do, uh, detecting methodological problems, uh, making recommendations, suggesting necessary controls, both positive and negative. So we're trying to make the protocol stronger uh, through this internal peer review. Uh, again, the peer review is independent, not, not fully because of the coordinating team looks at all of them, but uh, each, each independent protocol gets reviewed by independent labs who are trying to keep this variation. And of course, the, the replicating lab also always has the final word in, okay, no, we want to do this. I mean, we can recommend something different, but they have the final word of, on, on how they run the experiment. 
In the meantime, we also did a prediction markets uh, surveys kind of thing. So uh, we're interested in whether researchers can predict what results will be reproducible, what will not. Uh, so we did this uh, with the help of Anna Dreber in Stockholm, Dominic Veganola and, and other people. Uh, late last year, early this year, we had two rounds of surveys and markets in December and February. They were open to any researcher with experience in experimental research. Of course, like the vast majority here are life sciences researchers, but we had one or two people from different areas, which is interesting. Uh, uh, we had individual surveys where, where we had to predict uh, the likelihood of each experiment replicating in, in a qualitative sense, like whether this will find a, a significant effect in the same direction. Uh, and, and in a quantitative sense, so do we, do we expect the effect size to be smaller, greater, like what's, I mean, or, 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 or the same as the original one? People always, also had to fill in uh, their reasons for making predictions, so we're interested in like what researchers actually take into account when they do these predictions. So they did this via surveys, and after the survey, they got invited to a prediction market where it pretty much works like a stock market. You can buy stocks of an experiment, replicate it or not. This price has flowed. Uh, over time, and so people can actually calibrate their predictions uh, with uh, by looking at what what other people are predicting, and this, according to economists, might have some effect in terms of like the wisdom of crowds functioning. We had over two thousand predictions uh, with fifty seven participants uh, participating. Uh, so what we've done so far is pretty much that we we spent some time in selecting experiments, we spent some time in developing protocols and reviewing protocols. We did this prediction service. We have consolidated our protocols between late last year and early this year. So we're finally like, this took a lot longer than we thought. We thought we'd be starting experiments maybe like in the middle of last year, but uh, it took at least six months longer than, than we expected. It's very hard to keep everybody on schedule. Uh, it's a lot of labs. And, but we're, we're pretty much ready. So the, the blue ones are, are, are the, the ones that are ready to go. The purple ones are going through ethical review, but the protocols are ready as well. So like a few, a, a few are still missing, but we March was to be the, the, the month where we like start buying stuff and signing to labs and see the experiments happen. But then like the virus ate my project and uh, it's, it, 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 I mean, it, it, it's, it's quite ironic just, just as we're ready to start every lab, like 85% of our labs are closed down now, 15% are functioning with the street. So we're probably not starting out very much at the moment. We'll have to wait till this weird time passes to see the experiments happen, but they're pretty much ready to go, which is the good news. Uh, after they're ready, we proceed to data analysis. So our, our idea is, to, is that our main outcome uh, for application success will be the original studies effect size being within the 95% prediction info defined by meta-analysis of the replications. And this is interesting because using multiple labs can actually allow you to assess interlab variation, like real interlab variation from uh, methodological differences, condition differences, which is not due to bias. And I think this is very important. We have very little data to, of how well data replicates across labs. So we can have like this. Uh, so these are three possible scenarios. You can have, so this is the, the effect size here in the x-axis. So you can have our, our three replications actually agreeing very much among themselves and the original study being within this. So, I mean, this is what we call a successful replication. You can have our three replications again, agreeing among themselves and the original study being way out of bounds. And this is where we say, well, this probably has some kind of problem because even in three different labs, nobody gets close to this. But you can have this. I mean, you can possibly have replications that even doing it blindly, theoretically unbiased, we still get different results because people do different methodological decisions because conditions vary from one lab to the other. And then it's actually very hard to say, to judge the original finding. I mean, if, if, if we don't agree among ourselves, this may be just due to, I mean, this varies a lot from lab to lab, uh, depending on, 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 on small methods differences. And uh, again, this might be the case in, in a great many experiments, and it's, it's interesting to know as well. Uh, we're also interested in comparing this to more traditional reproducibility measures, such as, OK, do we find a significant effect in the same direction, this effect size within the confidence interval, et cetera. Uh, and uh, we're, we're doing some modeling work, but, but particularly Clebit, which is in the coordinating committee, to see how this stack up. We have, uh, done some shiny apps to to perform uh, simulations of different scenarios uh, to see how well these reproducibility measures measure uh, against each other. And of course, once we have uh, a set of replicated and non-replicated findings, we want to evaluate whether we can predict what reproduces from the original articles. So we want to see whether reproducibility depends on the experimental model or method, depends on the original effect size, significance, uh, p-values, 
uh, depends on the impact measured by citation or impact factor of the original publication, uh, whether it's getting better or getting worse over a 20 year period, uh, whether it depends on features of the uh, institution of the investigator and whether it can be predicted by other researchers. Of course, we don't know the variation in this, so we don't know, we're not sure we have the power to see all of this, but we'll at least try to perform this, this correlations. Uh, and uh, ultimately, I think the project is interesting because we learn a lot from it. Like even before anything happens, we don't have any results, but I think like we're learning every day from the experience because I mean, we're not used to do this large scale collaborative projects in biology and it's, it's fascinating what you, what you learn from it. Uh, one thing we've learned is actually possible to do. So like engaging a large number of researchers in a collaborative project is feasible. There's a lot of people out there who are interested of course, they have to be funded, but uh, uh, people are willing to put their time into this. They think it's a valid effort. And I think the, the, the feedback we get from our communities is, is quite good. That said, keeping everybody together in the same schedule is not feasible at all. Like labs have their own uh, ways to work. They have their own rhythms. There's all kinds of problems happening. So, I mean, we started out like, okay, so like everybody finishes this until then, and then we go to the next step and people have two months to finish this and it just doesn't work with 65 labs. So like uh, you have to, people have to take their time because people are different and, and, and conditions are different and you have to be very, very respectful for, of that. Uh, it's, it's always a, 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 a hard balance between democracy and, and, and centralizing. Uh, we're very centralizing, I, I confess, like, we started out with a protocol that was pretty much devised by, by us. And like the main idea of the project was, was pretty much centralized. That said, in terms of like experimental decisions, we try to use our collaborators' expertise as much as possible. Final decisions on the protocols are always on the replicating lab side. We're concerned of maintaining the, the project's identity. So like the main goals are this, but like uh, you are the guys who actually run the, the lab and, and, and know how to do this experience. We're actually working with techniques which we in the coordinating team really do not have expertise with. So it's a challenge to, to balance this as well. And the second thing we learned, like biology, bi biologists are, are just not, and that includes ourselves, are just not used to the logic of the pre-registered confirmatory experiment, the kind of like register report thing that Gilbert uh, has mentioned. Uh, we have no culture of that. Uh, most of what we do is very, very done in, in an exploratory fashion. Uh, which is not completely wrong. I mean, it's, it's okay to have exploratory science. I think it's interesting. A lot of good insights come from this. But if you want to move to confirmation, as people have argued, uh, we have to create a methodological framework for this to happen, uh, inclusion criteria for experiments. We have recently written about this. Uh, uh, and, and things that people are just not used to. I mean, everybody, when we started out, like, oh, do you want to suggest any controls? Like, everybody has controls to suggest, but like, how are you going to use this? Like, what criteria you use? Like, when to, to see to say that this is valid or not, this can go on. People are just not used to like presenting it. So actually that might create bias more because you can interpret the control in any way. Then so like we have to learn some stuff. We have to like figure out the best way to do this. And this is not easy. I mean again biology, basic biology runs in a different way from like a clinical trial that is very much planned from the start or from a large imaging experiments or from what can be done in psychology. Like protocols are are just on the go for, for many reasons which are valid. And it's it's not easy, but I think it's a very, very important question. How do you actually adapt this confirmatory science frameworks uh, to uh, experiments in, in, in basic biomedical science? This is it. We're also very present online. We're not as good as, as Gilbert in, in, in sharing everything, but we share a lot. Uh, maybe more chaotically, we, we have a website, we have a, 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 an OSF page as well, where you can see protocols and, and details of the project. We have a feature article that describes the main outcome, the main uh, outlook of it in, in eLife last year. Uh, we have been covered in, by a lot of media and we are pretty active on social networks. So you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, uh, or you can get in touch via email. And well, this is about it. We're open for questions. I would like to thank the organizing committee, uh, present and past members, which are truly awesome. And, uh, and uh, I would like to thank our funder and fundamentally I'd like to thank uh, the over 150 researchers around the country who are currently engaged in the project. We have 60 something labs at the moment. They are very, very, very spread out across Brazil. And this is very, I mean, this is truly, truly, truly uh, a pleasure for us to be working with all these people and to, to learn from all of them and to see whether this can actually happen as we thought it could. So thank you very much. And uh, we're officially open for questions. We have some people contributing via chat. 
So I think we can uh, take these. Uh, so Jorge Quilford uh, is uh, talking about the hydroxychloroquine story and debates on the subject and whether uh, Jorge, do you want to, 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 to do this question? Is this a long one? Do you want to do this on, on, on video? As, uh, but I think the idea here is uh, is whether uh, whether the the, 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 the attempt to, for, 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 for scientific outreach might be connected to the reproducibility crisis in biomedical science. I mean, I, I guess you're talking, we've had very specific local examples of, uh, there was a, a paper uh, describing a, a hydroxychloroquine plus acetromycin in very early flu symptoms that actually circulated via social networks and WhatsApp and whatever, even before it was posted as a preprint so uh, there's a lot of, of, of debate uh, going on uh, in, in, in social media, like outside of the scientific sphere on science, uh, on hard science these days because of the pandemic and everything. So do you think this is somehow connected to the reproducibility crisis or is this just a new, new thing that, that, that goes on top of it? I think you're muted. Yeah, uh, to me, this whole... Uh... So I think coronavirus crisis uh, really showed us that we have a problem in the way that we communicate science. It's not only that there's something problematic about the way that we do science or the way that we articulate science to one another in uh, publications, but there's also a problem in what happens between a publication or preprint to how things are communicated to the public. And as a citizen, uh, as a layperson, how do I make sense of what is real and what is not? Um, and especially when there's lots of different findings and everything is preliminary and you have preprints uh, and there's a lot of noise, how do you aggregate stuff? How do you know uh, what is, uh, you know, the aggregation of uh, scientific evidence? And we don't have good platforms for this. So uh, Open Science Framework has only existed for about five, six years, uh, revolutionary in the sense that well, now we can share and, and open things up, but we also need a way to make sense of these uh, findings. So now there are all sorts of initiatives. Uh, I know the ones in, in psychology, like Curate Science, uh, where people update, not only upload their preprints, but also in a way of structuring the data, what are the effect sizes, the confidence intervals, and then all the parameters, just like you showed in your slide, what uh, this makes this study different than others in all sorts of things, and then the aggregation of uh, things so that people can uh, take something out of that and, and come to some conclusion. But I think there's definitely a crisis in the way that we communicate. And also we need to figure out how uh, we take what it is that we do and bring this to the public so that we don't lose their trust again in communicating things that are false. Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. And I think it's really a, a crisis of, uh, of we don't have anything above this uh, was published in a peer-reviewed publication as a way of, okay, this is solid science. And being a peer reviewed version doesn't really mean anything in terms of like, quality, well, or very little in terms of quality control. And of course, there's things we know, right? I mean, we know that if you, if you apply insulin to somebody, glucose goes down. We know the earth is round. We know that the, 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 the planet is warming up and it's probably anthropogenic. So there's things that we're very certain about. There's things we're like almost certain about. And there's things that are published, but are still very, very preliminary. And I, I don't think the scientific community has found a way to, 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 to differentiate those. Uh, I think like clinical medicine has uh, attempts at it. So they have like guidelines, they have a, a much more established tradition of like meta-analysis of like grading evidence. Uh, so, I mean, that might be the best example I know, which is like closest to, 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 to biology. But again, I, I think we do a, 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 bad, a bad job in terms of like curating what, what is published and like, okay, we have a stamp that like, this is very, 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 very likely to be true which has to be greater yeah. than just publishing a peer-reviewed publication. We don't, really, we, we don't really do that job in terms of like grading what is published and what is like very likely to be true, what is still doubtful. Right. Well, one of the tasks that I gave my students um, was to try and assess the quality of both a study and a literature. And typically when we as scholars try to see, is there an effect, isn't there an effect? We used to go to our meta-analysis 
But if you think about it, a meta-analysis is published once in 10, 20 years, you know, after you have a, a number of studies. And then now we understand the meta-analysis typically covers what is published and it's very difficult to get people to open up their file drawer and things that are not published. So we've developed over the last 10 years all sorts of measures in order to assess publication bias. But still, if we need to wait 5, 10, 20 years for meta-analysis to be updated, this is such a waste of resources and there are all sorts of issues that we can address with a meta-analysis. So we need to find a way to take the scientific literature and make it a lot more efficient. We also can't use these PDFs anymore where you can't even you know, extract the data. How does a meta-analysis work? You have a, a, a few coders, just like you did with your, you know, the, uh, going over the papers, downloading whatever it is that you can, and then going over the PDFs and trying to code those. It's very inefficient. This is not the way that uh, you, know, you, you can advance things quickly. So we need to also think very uh, carefully about how it is that we uh, you know, disseminate uh, science, how it is that we aggregate science, how it is that we communicate science uh, to others. And there's a lot of groups in psychology that are working on this right now. We have a, a big conference called uh, SIPS, or the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science where we do hackathons. So we sit together in a, a, a round table and we hack uh, sort of uh, solutions. And one of the things that uh, uh, was very promising in the last steps is that we are trying to structure what is a hypothesis? How do you uh, communicate an effect size? How do you uh, match between hypothesis and an effect size? And how afterwards this automatically goes into a cumulative meta-analysis that every single point in time will give you the best up-to-date information about the evidence that exists. So lots of avenues and places to go with this. Yeah, and that's a, that has to be very subculture spe specific, right? Because I mean, in different areas of science, the metadata you actually need is probably different, like so what has to be communicated. So like, again, like we have to have like different communities talking about this. We have a couple of people raise hands. Uh, Tim Aaron is here actually, and, and uh, Michelle Andrade. So Juliana, can you put them in? Yes. Good to see you. Good. How are you doing? Fine. Um, so I do have a question, uh, and also and great. I mean, uh, thanks for the the overview of both the work. I'm obviously familiar with both of them. Um, the question I have for you, and uh, it's actually probably a bit more of a your viewpoint, is in my experience and in our experience at COS doing the replications is the the, the perceived conflict you can have when you're conducting a replication or even proposing to do a replication with original authors. And then related to that, and you guys were just talking about this, which is how the how other scientists and how the lay public perceives this. And so I'm curious to know two things. One is, have you guys experienced that? So for instance, you know, with undergrads, like what are their thoughts? Do they think it's BS, which is, is potentially a very dangerous thing to do um, if you just kind of dismiss a lot of research? Um, do, you, do they, and again, there's like lots of examples of kind of, in, in my opinion, uh, maybe not the right way to communicate uh, the inability to replicate somebody's results because then it can create antagonism, which is unnecessary. Um, so I'm just kind of curious about like your, percep your perception from both of your, your backgrounds and both of your projects of like, how, how are they perceiving it? And then over time, what's your perception? Um, and just to give a bit of a relation there is a project that we're working on with DARPA SCORE, um, is actually a really interesting project because we're going back 10 years and we're cutting across even more disciplines. And so it's uh, it's surprising on two fronts. One is how you still hit it. You still hit that conflict. And I've definitely engaged that a lot with the cancer biology project. But then we also don't. We actually get now a lot more embracing of it in certain areas where they're just like, excellent, great. This is exactly how it should proceed. So I'll stop there and just kind of let you guys uh, comment on, on that whole line of thinking. Give it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question and it's something that I, especially this week, uh, discussed following, uh, I saw some reactions to DARPA score and the things that were going on over there, uh, which troubled me uh, with original authors pushing back on, on the process, but also in 
Uh, so as I've shown, we submit these things to uh, journals and we've had a lot, a lot of rejections. First of all, desk rejections and then following uh, very hostile uh, peer review. Um, that really, really made me uh, re rethink this, uh, this whole thing about communicating with the original authors. And I, I want to say that at the beginning of the process, two years ago when I started this, uh, we didn't have any results. This was just an idea and I communicated to original authors and reached out to them and said, uh, so I'm a first year assistant professor working with uh, undergraduates in a place in Hong Kong and we're going to run this on Amazon Mechanical Turk and Prolific. Uh, we need your help. Uh, First of all, a lot of people didn't answer, and the ones that answered uh, were not uh, supportive. Um, and I have like a list of uh, all sorts of uh, people that started off by uh, thinking that there's no point in collaborating with us because there's actually absolutely no, no way for us to find anything. Uh, this is set uh, to fail from the, uh, from the beginning. And also people questioning the need and the investment of resource in replication and involving undergraduates uh, in, in this kind of thing. It's like, how can undergraduates do this sort of thing, especially if they come in second year not knowing anything. Um, but it's amazing that every semester, as I disseminate and communicate what it is that we do on uh, Twitter, the more that we submit this to the journal, uh, little by little, we get different uh, reactions. So first of all, there's, uh, I think, differences in the way that, uh, you know, early career researchers uh, respond to this, uh, which is generally, it's like a little bit of confusion. It's like, what does this mean? And how can we uh, make sense of this? But a lot of enthusiasm is like, it seems like something important is going on. So we want to be part of this. I think at the beginning, we got a lot of uh, pushback from uh, senior, senior researchers, but as, uh, you know, especially the more successful replications that we had, uh, the more careful, the more uh, guides that came out, the more templates, the more that we communicated these things uh, openly and, and, and transparently, I think the more uh, trustworthy uh, we were perceived to be. So it's a matter of whatever it is that you do. And I think DARPA score is doing a good job in this. It's just like communicating everything that you do very transparently every step of the way. So Starting from the pre-registration, I, I open everything up uh, for open uh, peer review, uh, invite people, whoever wants to come. Every guide is open to see what it is that we do. Uh, and I'm very transparent also about the weaknesses. You know, We are doing this with undergraduates. I'm in early career. I don't know what, uh, I don't have the answers for everything. Uh, so if you're humble, if you're transparent, if you're open, if you try to involve them, um, then I think there is the potential of uh, things changing. And over time, I think, uh, a lot to do with the center of open science and a lot of these ambassadors and people going around and talking about open science, people are changing uh, their attitudes. I can, I can see in my own department, uh, there used to be a lot of criticism and people thinking that I'm screwing up problems in their labs when I'm teaching their undergraduates, uh, all sorts of uh, things like that. But I think recently uh, the tone has changed. At the beginning they said, uh, okay, you're doing replications, but where is your real science? Where is your real contribution? Uh, but now suddenly people are coming and saying, oh, this seems like it's important. Like there's people that are interested, uh, uh, publications are coming out. So it seems like uh, they want to take more part in this. So I think it's, it's a process, it's, it's uh, changing. DARPA score, I think, is going to do so much better than many labs, one, two, four. You know, these, uh, uh, these got a lot of pushback. Uh, DARPA score is still going to have a lot of pushback, but not as, as much as, as before, and it's going to have a lot of also support and positive responses. For me, it's one of the most revolutionary uh, projects that we, we've ever had in social sciences. Yeah, we, we actually were surprised by, like, we actually have much less pushback than we anticipated initially. Uh, I think, for, like, our public image in Brazil is, is, is surprisingly good. Like, a lot of people anticipated this. Like, oh, we have reduction there. Uh, I think we've been very successful in avoiding it, or, or maybe just lucky, but uh, it's, we, we, I, I think from the start, and I think this is important, we try to, to, to picture ourselves, like, to, to, to sell ourselves as, we're not really replicating anybody's work. And I think it helps that we're replicating like individual experiments. I mean, even if this doesn't replicate, it doesn't, it doesn't really invalidate the, the, the paper, much less anybody's career. 
uh, we still have not uh, opened up which papers we're replicating to the public. So, I mean, it's, it's not a, like, we've been doing a whole lot of like, a, we've been going a long way without making this personal, okay, this is this paper, or this is this person. In any point, I think this helped. So we've been talking about it for two years. We've been like, gaining traction with the like, meeting collaborators with her. And like, even actually, even even our, our replicating labs don't really know whose work they're replicating because we're, we, we just extracted the protocols, but they're blind to the original studies, which created a lot of problems because then, I mean, a part of the interpretation is, is on us and that sometimes over. So, I mean, if I had to go back, I'm not sure I'll have done this decision again, but I think this helps. Like it's very non-personal. And I think it's that, that, that helps. We also made a, 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 an explicit decision from the start not to use, uh, I mean, try to, try to do the replications based on the paper without the help of the original authors that's different from our PCB and from a lot of other projects. Uh, it's not better or worse. I mean, there are different questions, I guess. Uh, we figure out that we would not get a lot of in useful information because we had like very, we have very old papers. We have papers from like the late nineties. It's like 98 to 2018. So like, we're not gonna find what was the temperature in the housing facility uh, in 2000, 2001. Uh, like, it's not, so we figured that like, we would get like low response from the authors that a lot of them would not be able to help because data might have been just lost along the process because these are old studies. And uh, we figure, okay, if we're gonna have like a very heterogeneous response, like only 30% of people who, or 50% of people respond and only 20% who have useful data, maybe it's just like uh, cleaner to do it uh, without the author's help. That's how we have contacted people. So we have sent, sent out emails to people who have had their experiments included, the corresponding authors saying, okay, we're doing this. We'll get in touch with you to get some information because we still want the information just to see like how close we are to the original protocols when we actually, be, when we're able to know this. Uh, like we didn't get many responses because like people were not asked to do anything yet, but like the few who had responded is like, oh, cool, nice. I mean, we didn't get pushback from anybody, but it's a, it's a very low response rate. Uh, but uh, again, I think, and I think from the public's perspective, I think uh, we've doing we've done very well in terms of. Of course, the results are not out. Like, of course, once the results are out and people realize that oh, this study did not replicate, we might get into that point. But like up to now, it's been we've been cruising through that. There's a there, there's an additional issue with the Brazilian Representative Initiative, which is the national thing, which is okay. We get a number for like. I think the psychology gets in the like subfield. Okay, if we do it in psychology and we get to do the oh, only 30 something percent of papers replicate, this makes psychology look bad um, uh, among other sciences. We have the country problem, right? Which might which may be even worse in terms of like the political situation at the moment. So we say like, okay, half of Brazilian science does not replicate. Is this good or bad? I don't know, like we don't know the numbers elsewhere. But it can be made to look very bad, and of course, like in a in a time in which science is very very undervalued in the country, I do get that this is going to be like a major challenge to communicate, uh, in terms of like not saying that this is a Brazilian only problem, and not saying that this makes our science worthless. And, 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 and again, I think we have to sell ourselves. Like we're I think psychologists is, is vanguard is, is very at the vanguard of the debate, and like you you're very early adopters of like a lot of stuff. And actually, like uh, I think it has made your science more credible, not less. I think we have to 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 make the same argument for like we're doing this, and like no other country has really tried something similar at the, at the moment. So like this put us ahead of the curve in terms of of, of, of how we're debating and, and, and addressing this. But it is a challenge. I think it, we have not faced it yet because up to now it's just like a good. It seems like a good idea, and everybody likes it. Once we actually get the results out, I think we'll, we'll, we'll have to think about the things. Uh, Michelle is somewhere here. Juliana, did you? Hey, at the chat, just in the sh at chat. Oh yeah, he he raised his hand, but uh, I, I I don't think he made a question. Yes. Uh, via chat. I think I oh yeah, I, I don't see he. Well, we we have we have others, right? So uh, there's Clarissa, but she has asked one again. So I'll, I'll move and leave her to last. Do you think the Corona pandemic will somehow speed up transition? To open science, preprint publication, data sharing, or do you think outside this topic things will remain the same? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a. I'm not. I'm not. I'm trying to be optimistic about this and uh, think this is an opportunity. But I have uh, a feeling that uh, it's not going to have as much impact as we would like it to have. Uh, I think that 
to us, this really shows to people who are already convinced that open science is good. I think this is uh, uh, like the ultimate evidence that we need open science in order to do things. But I've also heard people that don't uh, believe in open science saying that this is going to be the end of everything because we can't make sense of everything and not sharing uh, it all. I don't know. It's like uh, people find evidence in what it is that they already believe in. Hopefully this will make a change. Uh, but it will make a change if really we can uh, show some uh, conclusive evidence in support of this. And it's very difficult to do with uh, open science unless you have, you know, randomized and, you know, some consensus about how this, how this helps. I hope so, but I'm not that optimistic. What's uh, your take? I, I'll say I'm more optimistic. Uh, of course, like, it might not affect open science generally uh, equally, but like, at least like in preprint publication, I'm sure it helps because I mean, everybody, yeah. it, it had already helped in the Zika epidemic. So like 2016 is the, is the, is the year that, that, uh, that uh, preprints really took off in biology. And uh, in Brazil, at least, where we had like a huge Zika problem, uh, I, think, I, 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 I think that was one of the factors that, that, that helped. We had like good, like, uh, good case examples of like people like putting a preprint and getting published in science later and whatever. And so like, okay, so this is possible, this is important. And I think that's- After the pandemic, it stayed this way or it went back to normal what it was before? I, I, no, I think we gained traction. I think pre preprints are stably, are, are stably growing, uh, or hmm. maybe even more than stably, maybe it's exponentially growing by biology since then. I think it gets a lot of people familiarized with the formats. Like even if you don't do it now, you, you see that people, things are coming out in bioarchive and metarchive all the time. If you're distantly following uh, the coronavirus epidemic, you're, 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 you're at least getting in touch with that. You see that those things actually end up published in, in, in Science or Lancet or, or whatever later. And uh, you see that this is, well, maybe, maybe we can do this. I, I, I think the exposition to preprints definitely, I think, uh, is, is, is helping that. Of course, it also, uh, it also helps. I mean, people who have preconceived notions about it uh, make strong arguments that like whenever a junk preprint comes out and they will come out because I mean junk science happens both within and outside the peer-reviewed uh, uh, journals uh, people will use that as an argument where well, maybe we should reconsider preprints whatever that said I, mean, I think the debunking of preprints has, has been much faster than it has for for it's, it's usually is for peer-reviewed articles so like my idea is that we're, we're, we're actually fixing things faster but of course we have a huge problem in terms of like how information disseminates later through social media. And that's a little bit beyond our control really, because I mean, people, things will be used as arguments for, for pseudoscience, uh, but like peer reviewed uh, papers will be used for that. Uh, preprints will be used for that. And just like PDFs, which are not posted anywhere, such as this prevent senior study will be used for that. Or maybe even like fake PDFs, like somebody does like, I, I, I got all kinds of like complete nonsense in terms of like, uh, predictions of like how the pandemic will grow like sometimes just a pdf by somebody who works in the housing field uh, who like put up some numbers and they com completely meaningless but like people will share so i mean that's a little bit beyond no matter how we uh, how, how we decide to publish things uh weird things will get out and uh, it's it's controlling as it's, it's controlling that is like a whole different dimension of problems i think what we can focus is that this like as a scientific community we have the best system possible to evaluate evidence so, like to put a stamp of approval or, or, or of disapproval uh, in things as fast as we can. I think preprints help in that sense. But of course, uh, wh how they can be used uh, outside, uh, it, 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 it is a problem. We, we can deny the problem, but it's, it's not being invented by preprints. It will not go away if people will start, stop doing it. So, I mean, this is a problem we have to address through other, through other means. In terms of data sharing, et cetera, uh, could help, but I think then the effect is less clear. Uh, I'm not sure. It, it, that, that's actually a very good point, a very good question. I mean, are people opening up data? People are definitely using preprints more uh, during the pandemic. Uh, data. Are they opening up their data more? I'm not sure. Uh, I, yeah, I think it's, a very, it's actually a very good question uh, to, to address. Uh, it it is, might, might be easy to address, uh, but I don't know. It, it, it could be, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of good work for meta scientists to uh, evaluate yeah. what's happening right now and try and uh, estimate how this affected everything. Definitely, yeah, we have thought about in terms of like preprint dynamics. Are people using them more? We have like, are, do we have more authors engaging into this? But like for other open science things, uh, I'm not sure it, it's 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 going to happen. Uh, next question: Is there substantial effort in questioning current methods and proposing changes to avoid the necessity of reproducing studies? Uh, this may save. Yeah, I I, I fully agree. I, I think the the point is to get to that. 
I mean, we, we want to try to see whether, I mean, uh, one big question here in psychology as well is like whether we could have predicted this from the start, right? Because like, of course, if, if researchers can predict with like 60 or 70% accuracy, uh, which studies will reproduce, then maybe, I mean, we can, we, can, we, we can just focus on the ones that sound likely and just discard the other ones or, <clears throat> or, or not. I don't know, but that means like a lot of, <clears throat> if we know from the start that things will not reproduce, we know that there's wasted effort, right? I mean, we could have predicted it from the start. So I think a large part of it is like, how can you predict it? How can you evaluate it? And how can you uh, make sure that it does not have, like, what should, if we have, if you find good proxies for reproducibility, so like, okay, maybe uh, papers with a bigger effects or a lower p-value or which are blinded or which are randomized or whatever uh, are associated with like more replicable results, you can actually use this as proxies to measure Stuff. Of course, like every metric becomes a, uh, a bad metric once people take it as a target. Uh, that's a good hard law, but... Uh, yeah, I think, uh, so you're working with the prediction markets and we're working with the prediction markets. Uh, our efforts are relatively small, so you can't generalize from those uh, to everything, but the DARPA score with 3,000 uh, replications, uh, also working with prediction markets, I think is aimed at trying to generalize. So. Also looking at all sorts of factors. So people typically default to what is the p-value, but now we know the p-values have all sorts of uh, weaknesses. So you look at other things in all sorts of parameters uh, within the original articles, trying to give you what is a better assessor of whether this will replicate or not. So you have two things. You have you know these models, uh, machine learning models of uh, you know just putting the parameters of an article. But I think also the interesting thing about these prediction markers is also showing that for some reason, and we're not really sure how they're doing this, but people have some intuition about what uh, uh, is able to predict this or not. So the prediction markers by Anna and the, 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 the Swedish uh, uh, group uh, working on this, they're able to show that people have good intuitions in predicting what will replicate or not, and now trying to model these predictions in order to help us assess not having to reproduce and replicate everything, but also being able to generalize from that. Yeah, that said, I mean, intuitions are much easier to get in psychology than in, 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 in basic sure. biology, say. So like I did, the, I, I did the, the, there's an online quiz for the uh, social science replication project when they just yeah. give you this actual, I got 20 out of 21 rights. And like, I'm just like, oh, but, 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 but it's, my post, I got like 18, uh, the other guys in the group were like 14. It's like most people, like lay people, and there's data on that, can actually make a judgment. Okay, this just looks incredible, like too incredible. And like yeah. those, those science papers were, were, were definitely like, okay, yeah, this can be true. And like that intuition was pretty, was actually pretty good. So like even without looking at math or statistics, whatever, just you had a common sense intuition that this seems likely, this does not seem likely. I'm not sure that will hold for our project, like whether this, I mean, very specialized people in the field might have a intuition, but like that's gonna be like two or two or three people working in the same field. Like the general biologists won't really know whether drug X actually kills cell Y. So I, I think we might do much worse than what you have done in, in, in economics. Those are hard. I mean, I look at the, at the experiments for some of them, I, okay, no, this, this uh, mostly for methodological reasons, but like for my, many of them, I don't have a clue and uh, I'll never make 20 out of 21 on, the, on, on this, I'm sure. So like, I think it, that, that might be very subfield specific. And I think like psychologists probably like, like whatever is like common sense, uh, this is closer to common sense, will probably get the best predictions. Con and concern the machine learning models that can work, but again, uh, they're, they, they will be focused on like very specific and they, they're probably easy to game as well. Because like if people realize that like the, what, what matters is like people describing blinding, whatever, they just say it's that it's blinded. And uh, so uh, I'm, I'm worried that, that, that the metrics might become uh, just an artificial way of people like making their papers more reliable if we take them too seriously. I think it's good to, this one's a great to like gain insights on what matters. But I mean, we should be very skeptical of like using this for like actually evaluating people. And uh, yeah, I, mean, I just want to say like as a side note that I think Replications cannot be eliminated completely. Replications need to become mainstream and part of the process. So if you publish a paper, it needs to be follow-ups on this. So we need to encourage people. We need to incentivize uh, replicators and, and give people the opportunity, the career chance, the uh, funding, in order to run replications and not you know, uh, marginalize them. Uh, 
uh, outside of, of academia. So people open up their file drawers, people take the initiative to run replications. So we want to minimize, you know, having to go and revisit everything that we've done since science began till today. But we also want to make replications far more mainstream in order for people to take up the, the uh, task of, of running replication so that we wouldn't have to revisit everything uh, from scratch. Yeah, and then the first question is what worth rep is what's worth replicating as, as well. So like we get we, we, we get a few comments sometimes like from us from ourselves or from, from our collaborating labs like okay this is just like so badly described it's not worth replicating it's not worth trying. We don't even know what's what's selling it and I mean we're uh, we, we're assuming that everything is worth trying like even if this is completely you, you cannot understand the protocol, that's data, right? I mean, if you just exclude this, this is gonna be like, oh, no, we should run to see if, if we really can do this. So like we're doing this anyway, but I get the, I, I accept the argument that like, you, you could argue that these are waste of resource because it's like the, the, the original description is so bad that we, we, we could have like described this as a failure just like you, without trying. But I think this is a little bit unfair as well. So, I mean, maybe even if it's better described, like the general idea can be done. So we're still doing anything, everything. But I think an important question is like, how do we decide what's really important and worth replicating? And what, what we have to be sure of this and this and this. So we'll try this out and do it in like a lot of labs. And what may be just like not as important or maybe just like it just doesn't sound real. So we might as well not go into it. So I think there's a... There's a yeah, yeah, that's I, the, kind of the process, and I know this is easier in psychology, but whenever somebody comes to me with an idea that is based on the literature, I say, how about as a first step, let's just do a replication first. And then if this works, then we build on this and do the, the extra step that you want to take. Ma many of our replications, I, I put this up as a replication project that we're doing, but almost all of our replications are replication plus extension. So while we're doing extensions, while we're uh, you know, uh, expanding the literature, we're building new ideas, but we want to revisit the older findings. In order first, if something didn't work, if the extension didn't uh, come out as expected, is it because your idea is not good or is it because the replication uh, failed? So almost everything that I do right now with my students, even if it's a novel um, uh, direction, I say, let's start with a replication. So replication plus extension, and then if this works out, then we can go for the next step. And I think biologists do this as a they, they commonly will replicate something before going on to like extending something. But like if the if it fails, people just give up on it. So like yeah. this don't really get into the scientific record, and I think that's a big uh, that's a big problem. So Clarissa uh, asks whether you would think that uh, more as methodologies become complex, uh, the crisis intensifies. Like it's going to get even worse as methods are more complex. Uh, give it. So, so what will get worse? Uh, as methodologies gets com gets more complex, the reproduci the, the reproducibility problem should uh, intensify and oh, should be more complicated. For sure. Like I so this is this is my intuition, right? I don't have uh, meta science evidence to support it, but one of the first decisions that I uh, set for myself is that I'm going to simplify everything that I do. First of all. We understand that if we do even a simple interaction, but definitely uh, uh, moderation, mediation, multi-level errors going in every direction, we need huge samples for that. We never really took power into consideration uh, as much as we should have. Uh, we, we now understand that we can use larger samples because in psychology we can run things easier. But generally we have a big issue with the uh, sample size that we can run, especially in the, in the hard sciences, the exact sciences, so given the understanding that it's very difficult for us to get large samples, we cannot test complicated models. We need to simplify everything and make sure that our statistics and our models, you know, the way that we design our experiments is set so that it will be reliable. So we can't expect using, I don't know, uh, I, most of my uh, University of Hong Kong psychology department are uh, neuroscientists. So, you know, you've got 10, uh, 20 at the best people that you can put into the uh, the scanner. So with these kinds of samples, you can't really do a moderation, mediation, uh, multi-level sort of uh, insights. Even if you do a very elaborate within design, you really need to adjust your resources and your capabilities to the methods that you use. And you need to understand uh, the implications of what it is that you're using. So complex models require certain things that we now know are very expensive or that we don't have. So for me, 
simplifying. So I focus on the main effect. Probably if there's an interaction, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I take much effort into uh, trying to, to uh, adjust in terms of uh, power. Um, and just generally, I think we're also incapable of understanding, communicating, disseminating complex findings to the public. And I'm not talking about public like uh, uh, presidents or laypersons. I'm talking even practitioners. If we give them something that's too complicated and we don't give like all the steps that came before that, they don't know what to do with it. So my first step, simplify everything, focus on uh, uh, main effects, uh, basic interactions and work your way up from there in order to adjust the methods and the de design to what it is that we're capable of. Yeah, I generally agree. And of course, I could go outside of psychology. There's a whole problem, not only like complex models, but like complex methods and machines yeah. and gadgets and, and expensive stuff, right? And of course, at the limits, you have experiments that have been done in the CERN with like 25 kilometers right, that nobody else can replicate because I mean, that could only have been done there. So like, if you take like some areas of physics, I mean, it's like, of course, they, they, they're very good in like working as community, but really like, okay, this is like the community's answer to this. And like, there's no way some, somebody's going to spread it because no, nobody can run the experiment again. So that's like the, the, the top scenario. But even in biology, I think there's some, some very complex methods that like two or three labs in the road actually can actually do well. And those are very hard. Uh, and, and again, like I think, but we, we, don't really, we, we don't even have data on the simple ones. So, I mean, like, let's try the simple stuff first. If this yeah. doesn't work, then well, then we have a problem. Like, if, if this works, then maybe we can try, like, for many things in biology, it's very hard to run a, a replication initiative as we are doing because they're much more RC and, 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 and complicated and they can need the very, very large skills or resources to, to, to do stuff. The other thing is, like, the more complex methods get, the more complex data analysis tends to get. And so if you go into, like, functional uh, neuroimaging or, like, uh, a gen microarray data, whatever. there's like so many statistical steps to, just to get to a result and like so much like, flexibility at each step uh, in the pipeline that like you can use that to like tell any story. I think like fMRI has been the, the prime example of this uh, from the, the, the fields I'm used to at least. And uh, of course, like, those are the fields that can be, perhaps be best, uh, can benefit the most from like pre-registration, which is kind of happening in your region now. And from like uh, building big consortia that uh, do things in standardized fashions. That was the case in genomics, for example, which has definitely improved its, its reproducibility record. I mean, you've gone from like studies like 300, 400 people to studies like 500,000 people in terms of like genetic epidemiology. So like that, that, that's actually a good example of like a community coming together. Okay, so what we need to find are small effect sizes. Uh, there are a lot of genes who so have like a huge multiple comparison problem. So like let's do this the right way. And I think uh, it kind of has stuck. So I think we have these good examples to follow where like people realize their methods are complex and find uh, appropriate solutions to it. And, but I think there's a, like a lot of communities that have not addressed this as well. Uh, I'm not sure I have any more questions here. Uh, I have a question for you. Given, so your students are undergrads uh, in early in their career. Is that it? Uh, like or early, or early in the psychology course. Yeah, so uh, the first course that I run this with is a second year uh, introduction to social psychology. Uh, we call this fundamentals of social psychology, um, where the only thing that they had is basic stats. Uh, in their first year, they maybe ran a t-test or, you know, somebody sat with them in, uh, to show them, unfortunately, in SPSS, how to do very simple things. Uh, but when they come into uh, the course, I take them step by step using uh, tutorials, using open guides. Uh, I put a lot of the learning on them. Uh, first of all, because I realize a lot of things I don't know. So I'm, I'm trying to take the humble way out. But also, I, I believe in their ability to uh, educate themselves. If I give them the direction of where things are and where they can find information, they're actually able to do much better and they're very good with technology. So they're able to pick up R very, very fast and find all the packages that are able to do all sorts of things. And they're also very good at communicating with one another. So as early as second year undergraduates, we uh, start with this, but the highlight of what I do with my undergraduates is doing the fourth year. And this is advanced social psychology. Um, and this is our capstone. So. These are people or students that are specifically interested in understanding uh, how research and how academia works. It's not necessarily that they want to be in academia, but they want to understand the scientific process. 
So it's meant for a research project. Typically what we do or what we did before is, you know, tell them whatever it is that you want to do, like a thesis, you know, let's, let's uh, uh, see what we can do. And then they write proposals. Uh, but I wanted to do uh, things that are very defined, collaborative, on a path to something, and that by the end of the semester, it will be a, a publishable uh, manuscript built on, on pre-registration and a real data collection. Um, and it's amazing that we've been able to, uh, so at the beginning, uh, I, was, uh, I, I said, if, if I set unrealistic expectations, if they meet me a quarter way, halfway, uh, then we've done uh, an amazing job. I would say about 70 to 80% of them uh, are able to meet all of my expectations and about 30% of them far exceed my expectations in taking uh, uh, what it is that I was hoping to do and, and taking us into a whole, a whole different level, a whole, a whole new level of, of complexity, of openness, of, of uh, uh, research transparency. Yeah, I wasn't really thinking about ability actually, it's more like uh, engagement. So like uh, my impression is like, uh, so I, I do a lot of uh, teaching in statistics and stuff, which are, and reproducibility, which pretty much goes into the same direction. So like if you, uh, my impression is like, if you do it very early in, 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 in the undergrad studies, they're just kind of like not that interested because I mean, they, uh, it, it's harder to start with saying we have, it goes with like what Tim said, if you don't even build something, it's very hard to like, people want to first get exposed to science, then they realize, oh, there's all, all these kinds of problems. So they, they are very, people are very, very open to this discussion and to, 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 to debating this and actually have very good insights on, 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 on the, what the problems are by the end of the undergraduate studies, the, maybe the beginning of your, of your graduate studies. So I mean, to me, in like teaching statistics is like the perfect moment to, to, to intervene, of course. Uh, it, it might be a waste of resources because they, they first like learn a lot of stuff in terms of, like how they do research and then they learn oh guys this is so you've been doing a lot of stuff wrong but it, it helped me to like people already feel that this is important that like yeah they, they've managed i mean they, they, they they've they've realized that like oh throwing out this data points is probably not right and like people are doing this all the time so like you have more subject to debate this stuff if people are a little more advanced so we're just thinking about engagement like how do the 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 the, the early student, like the, the the early course students actually view them? I mean, do they get excited about it? Because I, I I feel it's easy to get people excited about it when they realize that we have a lot of problems. But like if they're just starting on the course, uh, I just wanted to know like uh, about their view. Like, wouldn't they rather be like first believing things and then disbelieving? And second thing, do you think any of this is specific to Hong Kong? Like, I, I mean, I guess like uh, it's, it's a very specific uh, place and 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 time. So like people have probably better skills in terms of like math and uh, computer and, uh, and coding and other than, than elsewhere discipline maybe. So like, do, do you think that the, your, your model actually works uh, elsewhere as well? Uh, just as well, like, I mean, you've been through the Netherlands, uh, you, you, you're from Israel, I guess. So like, uh, how do you feel this, this international thing? Um, yeah, so actually I'll, I'll start from the second one. Uh, so, for me, one of the reasons why I was uh, spending the most of the last year going around the world and finally getting to Brazil in order to present this sort of thing is because we're inviting collaborations uh, where we're hoping that people will take uh, what it is that we've done and at least try it out in different uh, places. I know that a lot of people are skeptical and then one of the first reactions is, okay, so you were able to do this in one of the, like, the top universities in, in Hong Kong or Asia, uh, but this will never uh, work uh, with our students. And my, my reaction to this is, let's make this an experiment. How would you know unless, unless you tried? And by now we've, we've gone through all of the difficulties. So we give you uh, ready materials for you to try this out and there's no harm in trying this out. So don't immediately implement this and everything that you do across the university, but definitely we want to see other people and work with other scholars to pilot this in, in other uh, places. Uh, my initiative is not the only initiative. So if you uh, look online, some of these are in my slides. So you have CREP, uh, where, um, and they're very successful. And we're talking about many countries around the world, definitely not just Hong Kong, uh, where you have undergraduates, sometimes in their thesis, or sometimes in their coursework, uh, working on replicating. They're replicating things that are much more uh, recent. They're choosing their replication targets very carefully. And they're more social psychology than judgment. Uh, decision-making or, or social cognition. Um, so 
there's a few initiatives with already enough evidence to show that this is not a Hong Kong thing and undergraduates can do well. I even know of some initiatives that are trying this with high school students. Um, so it's just, I think it's a matter of uh, communicating openly about the challenges. I think it's, uh, 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 you know, what it is that they can benefit from this, uh, trying to motivate them uh, to do this well and really structuring everything for them step by step, what it is that they need to do and uh, moving from this, uh, you know, instructor with a PowerPoint tells the truth to students, moving from that into a model where students take responsibility. So in my postdoc in Maastricht University in the Netherlands, they have something called problem-based learning. Actually, the instructors don't stand in front of a class. The students do everything. So they are the ones that set the learning goals. They are the ones that go out and seek information. They are the ones that come and integrate it. And for me, this is what science is about in the way that we communicate. Now, about how do we, how do we, how do we get people on board for this? Uh, so at the beginning, I have to say, uh, my course is very different from everything else that's done at the university. So the first two weeks in the add drop period where students can drop out, I set expectations very, very clearly, telling them everything, including the scary part. So the students that remain after the two weeks and choose to stay in my course and work with me on this are students that have been scared, <laughs> Uh, uh, understood, I even give them an, a, a, a quiz, an exam on the syllabus so that it's like a contract between us. You know, I tell them what is expected and they tell me we've read and understood and we accept this as a challenge. So the ones that we went, remain with me in my class uh, are already uh, seem to be motivated or at least curious uh, about what is going on and what's happening in, uh, in this class. So what's, um, the I what's that? What's the dropout rate? It's very, it's very high. <laughs> and, and, and because I'm not the only one giving these uh, sessions, so fundamental of social psychology is given by different instructors and advanced social psychology uh, is given by different instructors. I've had uh, a lot of students come in and complain about the, how, how much uh, more hard this is, uh, especially in the first semester where everything was confused and we didn't have a lot of structure and there were a lot of challenges and not everything worked. Uh, there was a lot of frustration during the semester, but when the office came to me, the department office came to me and they said, you know, a lot of people are complaining. Is everything okay? Uh, I told them, let's hold off with this for a while. Let's let, you know, the semester end. Let's see the evaluations. Then give me another semester. And if at the end of the year, uh, the students push back so, uh, so hard on this, then, then we can go back to the original. But by the end of the year, the evaluations for this, uh, session and how uh, people conclude their experience is a very, very positive uh, experience about this whole thing. And especially, and this might be a Hong Kong thing, I don't know, uh, but it's definitely a cultural stereotype, which is why I try and avoid this kind of conclusion. But uh, there is a lot of competition and the competition here is about doing well. So if you set the competition and the incentives for transparency rather than finding significant value P lower than 0 0.05, it's amazing how uh, well they do on, on transparency. So sometimes we have pre registrations of like 70 pages, uh, and then we need to uh, like structure this in order to uh, make this uh, more, more feasible for people to go, to go over this. But by the end of the uh, second semester, the end of the year, when they saw that we're getting uh, media attention from, uh, you know, uh, uh, mass media like uh, Psychology Today. Uh, the people are reacting on Twitter. Uh, we've had the first uh, publication being accepted. So for undergraduates to be able to put on their CV, first of all, that they have a preprint, so, you know, with another scholar. Uh, and it's not just me, but also uh, early career researchers from around the world. So they've collaborated on a real science project that they can put on their CV. But if it's published in a journal, this is a big boost for them uh, when they're applying not just for academia, but for every job uh, in the industry. So once a word of this came out, <laughs> suddenly there's a lot more, uh, a lot more interest and the students are willing uh, to do a lot more and invest above and beyond uh, the requirements of, of the course. So I think it's about structuring things up. It's about being, uh, setting expectations correctly, but also at the end, giving some incentives uh, for them to do well in open science and take part in this kind of initiative. Yeah, Brazil has a very long tradition of 
engage in un undergraduates in research, but it's mostly at the lab level. So people will look out, look up for lab and then and start working there. So it's just not very well integrated with like the the, the, the whole uh, the whole course and stuff. So, but 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 I do I, I definitely think the model works. Just wondering like what's the best time to do it. But uh, I, I I I certainly agree with with, with the with the thing the undergrads can do stuff. We, we've, we've worked with cross source projects as well. And I definitely agree that like setting the expectations on transparency is the way to go. I think we have a, and that's not that hard to do, but I think we have a very long way to go uh, in, in, in biology at least in terms of like valuing this as we should. It's happening, but I think it's, it's, it's just slow. And but we, as institutions, I think we can definitely do much more in terms of like evaluating people on the right things. Yeah, I just uh, want to say, if anybody is interested in trying this sort of thing, then please reach out to me and I'll share everything that we have and we can talk about how you can do it. Even if you're a biology, but you want your students to do uh, some research just to get their hands dirty in something like judgment decision-making in psychology, we can work together on this just for, so you can get them to understand open science and method. Yeah, I, I think that's a valid point. I mean, of course, the problem in biology is like, well, it's, it's, it's expensive to do stuff. But I mean, in terms of like science training, I think it's personally reasonable for like people to start like, yeah, like to, to, to get trained in data analysis, whatever. I mean, just get like, uh, an open data source uh, out of something. I mean, there's a lot of can. The, 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 I mean, there's a lot of things that can be done as secondary analysis on primary data. I mean, of course, that's that's not hands-on lab training, but in terms of like stats and analysis and whatever. I mean, there's a lot of projects you can do just with, with what's out there, which uh, are not as. There could be replications, could be just like new analysis, but uh, I mean that and and that is free basically. So I think we we, we can go in that direction, even in biology or or, or in expensive fields, right? Uh, do you have any more questions? Yeah. No, uh, no. So yeah, I think we can call this a day, right? I mean, we've been talking for an hour and a half already. Uh, it, it's been it's been really great to meet you. I mean, I'm sorry we, we, we can't have we can't have the barbecue and the team along. I mean, it's been a more like a so like a lonely experience here. Uh, like most people not show up in video as well, so like we don't really see everybody, but. Uh, uh, we've been, we, we have, a, uh, we've had a reasonable audience, it's now decreasing slowly, but uh, so that probably means we have to, we have to end here, but like, thank you very much for, for being with us. I definitely think we share. Yeah, it share. was, it was a pleasure. Uh, and I, I have a feeling, uh, uh, I'm going to make it back to Brazil once all this craziness is over and then yeah, we can meet in person and do more. Yeah. And same for us. And, uh, we are certainly welcome to, to come here and, and, and meet the team whenever. So this will be recorded online. It should be on our, uh, YouTube channel uh, shortly, I think is, you can probably watch the streaming Facebook even, even after the sense, right, Shadana? Right. Yeah, so I mean, if you, if you want to like reach out to people and and, and, and and tell them about this, I mean, this is gonna be accessible online. Otherwise, uh, both of us, uh, give it much more than us, uh, have sent links and, and, and stuff, but if you wanna look us up as well, I put up, give it uh, on the chat, but our website is, reproducibilidade.bio.br so uh, you, you, you're welcome to, 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 to look us up there we're in Portuguese and English and uh, we're just fine so uh, thank you very much right. for being with us uh, give it thank you very much for accepting yeah. this and hopefully we'll uh, in a month or two come back with like uh, more of these debates with other people as well thanks right. a lot bye bye <laughs>